Hello, welcome to the Autocar Podcast, My Week in Cars, with Matt Pryor. Steve Cropley, hello Stephen. Hello mate, how's it going? Very good. Where are we today, Steve? Well, I think we're in the lair of Mr Richard Hammond, the well-known television type and uh, car, um, classic car mender and uh, fixer and general lover of, of those cars, but... Uh, yeah, here we are. Yeah, Richard, welcome to the podcast. Hello, welcome to my lair. I've never had it called a lair before. How, like would, you, lair. how would you describe where we are and and yourself these days? Well, we are at the Smallest Cog, which is my classic car restoration workshop uh, on the outskirts of Hereford. Um, you've actually arrived on our big clear-out day. Mm. Um, you, I, I, you, out there right now, if you look... It looks like a really chaotic car boot sale has broken out. That's actually the tidiest it's looked in months. There have been three days at it. Because we're having a big reset. Mm. So I've, I've told them, right, we've got we to gotta get right back to basics. I mean, if, if you've seen, we make a TV show about it as yeah. well. But I mean, the workshop is a genuine business. It's, it's, but this is actually, you know, you're, you're slightly minimising it, aren't you? This is a place with a... With its own paint booth, its own fettling booth, a, a, quite a lot of workshop space, lifts and, yeah. you know, mezzanine floors and God knows what. I, I got carried away because <laughs> when I set it up a few years back, um, he's out there now, I see Neil Greenhouse had been restoring some of my cars. He did a 62E type Roadster for me, a Bentley that I've sold um, and a few other cars. And it was going along well. And on a Friday afternoon, if I wasn't working... I used to take the fish and chips along for fish and chips Friday, obviously, um, and we'd all sit in the workshop and chat about cars and life generally. Was this his place? No, he was in a much smaller workshop, still in Herefordshire, and I arrived one day and he was a bit down and said, you're all right, mate. No, not really. Why? Well, I'm losing the workshop. That's my impression of him. Uh, <laughs> it's brilliant. It could be him in the room. <laughs> uh, so they were, he rented it. He was losing the workshop. He wasn't in a position to sort of start again. So I just said, well, look, I... I want you to carry on doing my cars because I love your work. You can't just work for me. A, I'm not Jay Leno. And B, there's not a lot of dignity in just working on cars for some guy off the telly. So why don't we set up a little business together? I'll bankroll us into another workshop. If you spend half the time working on customer cars to pay the overheads, the other half of the time you can work on my cars. Mm. And then I thought that might make a nice little telly show, actually. And Discovery agreed. And commissioned it. But of course, when it became a TV show, I got ambitious. So one of the problems the workshop suffered from over the last year or two is I've been making us run before we can walk. I've been sort of prancing around on the lawns at Hampton Court. I've seen you there, Steve. You've seen, uh, we've seen you at many of them. there. <laughs> exactly. He's one of the exhibits. Uh, and <laughs> Charming. Charming. <laughs> and, See this? At least I've got a free copy. This is how it goes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've, I've been pushing it too hard, so I, and I need us to actually go back to basics. So that's why we're clearing the workshop out, getting tidy, getting organised, getting the workshop working as a machine. We're restoring our restoration workshop. And then we need to, I think, we need to do a car to the nth degree to show what we can really do. Because I saw you at Festival of the Other Exceptional. Yeah. The, I've got our award there. Yep. The Very nice. 2012 Nice Try Award. <laughs> <laughs> the best effort to enter what an ineligible car. Because <laughs> it wasn't even eligible. What was and the car? I've forgotten. It was Oliver. My 1962 Opel Cadet. Oh, uh, why is that Oliver. ineligible? Yeah. It was the wrong year. Oh. And, and I tried to sort of squeeze the thing. And I'm just... We tried never, to change the rules, basically. Yeah, I did. Yeah. We've never done anything properly because if you're trying to restore a car, you're reliant entirely upon the budget of the owner. Yeah. They come to you with a budget, and obviously we want to do it. We want to make it perfect, and their budget becomes our budget because if they've got 10 grand to spend on it and it's going to cost 40, hmm. they want to do the extra 30 grand worth of work, but they won't be paid. So no. either I end up paying it or we can't do the car to the level we want. So I've got a, a plan at the moment. To, to get a car in that is one of my cars. That it's going to be do. perfect. Yeah, so we've got an old RS2000 that we did uh, two years ago. It, I Which bought, one? The one with the plastic nose? The, yeah, exactly yeah. right. There's a picture, somebody sent, kindly sent me a picture of it there. It's dark blue. It had been used as a road rally car in Ireland. Um, we bought it. I bought it um, with a view to restoring it. We did um, <laughs> because I, I pushed us to get it done too early. So we've made some mistakes with the paint, which has shown up. I also, because I pushed us to get it done too early, we didn't get to register it in the UK. So the buyer at auction pulled out because it wasn't UK registered. And then also because I pushed it, we I ended up, it got damp under the paint. So some of the paint has bubbled and needs replacing. So we're going to do that 
as the perfect car and say, there you go, that's what we can do. And this will be from there you'll you'll take other people you, you well that'll be a show other... car we do we take work in already yeah I mean, we are, we're a genuine workshop on this yeah. there's always well i can see by the certain amount of uh, <clears throat> detritus on the floor that you've obviously done work before how kindly put <laughs> yes it's it's a mess uh, it's really hard running a business i'm a television presenter right. yeah this is a digression Tell for you this is a new yeah. thing to actually you know take people and run a you know, a, a business where there is manual work involved, proper work involved. It's, it's really you know, grown up. Not it? cocking around in No, cars. no, it's, it's actually grown yeah. up stuff. So people come along with their cars to be restored. Um, yeah, we make a TV show about it, but they just sort of follow us around. It's not mm. It's not a TV show, it's a workshop. But your partners are uh, car restoration. Oh, they people. are, yeah, they're the real deal. Yes, yes, absolutely. I corral them and persuade them into working sometimes. It's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and provide them with a nice working environment, which is what we're doing here. So what's I mean? What do you see as being the way the the television versus actual work will uh, will um, will break down? Will it be um, will it be a lot of cars and not much t- a lot of TV and not much cars? Or no, the TV cars? just happens around. It's the cars coming. It's that we do the work for real. It has to be. You're taking people's money. They're paying for it. Yeah. So it's got to be work to a standard, and it will be. And I want to grow the business. Bearing in mind what we're doing here, it's kind of the greenest thing we could be doing in terms of cars right? absolutely yeah. because yeah I mean there the, are the changes coming and I know Steve you want to talk about um, what's going to happen to cars the key thing to establish they're not going anywhere any device we can create that can move us around the world to carry out our lives we need we need food shelter warmth a mate all of those things our homes provide shelter. Everything else beyond that, you've got to go out and get. Which is why when we devised a machine that took us to do, uh, took us out to do that more effectively, it's the most important thing we've ever made. Mm. That isn't going to change. We no. still need to move ourselves corporally about the world. So they're not going away. They will be undergoing change. Um, new forms of, of emotive power. Yes, electric vehicles as advances all the time. But is it China are now doing sodium batteries? Uh, sodium yeah, sodium. well, everybody's having a go at it. They're, they're, As opposed to lithium. Yeah, they're trying to get rid of the lithium, aren't they? So it, it, massive advances Cobalt in Cobalt as well. And it's really exciting. I love watching it unfold. Yeah. Engineering is going to save us. So you don't see, you, you're not you're not somebody who's kind of corralled in the classic car area at all. I mean, you, 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 you welcome the future like the rest yeah, of us. Yeah, we're part of it. Yeah. Because on the one hand, a, a new car, if a new car is being made... If, if it can be electric or hydrogen combustion, or which uh, JCB are already doing, or hydrogen fuel cell, great, these are all alternatives. But there's also synthetic fuel, which can be made renewably, although it's very inefficient to make. It's a way of banking renewable energy that often would otherwise be thrown away. Mm. Europe's forever overproducing renewable. Well, if you use it to make, to crack hydrogen renewably, bank that, combine mm. it, with carbon to make a hydrocarbon you've got synthetic fuel and then you can use a car whose carbon footprint might be 50 years old yeah yeah for a lot of people the greenest thing we could be doing is make do and mend rather than incur the carbon footprint of a new car or of turning a petrol station into a charging station go out and buy I don't know Series 2 Ford Fiesta restore it using renewable materials I know Renault are now exploring for the new scenic that was the sound of work did you hear it was it was somebody some work just happened somebody dropped a diff on their toe some work it still counts we can probably still build someone that could be 5p so Renault are experimenting with renewable materials in the new scenic yeah so we could somebody should be reworking quite cool retro cars whose carbon footprint of manufacture is 40, 50 years ago, mm. restoring them renewably using renewable energy and renewable resources for the interior and what have you, and then drive it. Yeah, it sounds good, doesn't it? And if you ran it on synthetic fuel, yeah. it was even cleaner. Even if you run it, was it Henry Pearman at the HCVA? He did those calculations whereby the, the average classic car, if it does less than 1,000, 2,000 miles a year, because its carbon footprint of manufacture is in the past, yeah. Its total carbon footprint a year is half that of your mobile phone. Or yeah, it's astonishing. Yeah, I think yeah. the average is about fifteen hundred a year, something like that. Tops, yeah. isn't it? Was, so, the, so it's yeah, it's, it's, it's all so about normal. you know copies on at the moment, and yeah, a lot of it is about making deals for fuel and and, and fuel integrity and security within within nations. I get that. Um, 
things are going to change, but it's engineering that will save us. And we can't ignore any one route to it. We can't all drive brand new EVs because no. they're expensive. Most people will spend, you know, five grand on a car. I'm going to dump 50 grand on a new Hyundai. Mm. Also, you've got to harvest the materials to make the batteries, which is impactful. That's not to say I'm got against... got to carry it across the world, too. Well, a small matter of shipping yeah. it across the world. But I'm not yeah. anti-EV in any way. I'm really not. It's a, going to be a big, full, exciting picture with a lot of things in it. Full electric, hybrids, carbon, hydrogen combustion, hydrogen fuel cells, old-fashioned... Com the combustion engine itself never damaged anything. It's the fuel. Mm. And there are alternatives to the fuel. And once they're made at scale, they'll be affordable, which means 1.4 billion cars can stay on the road. And blokes like me can restore them. That's great, yeah. <laughs> now then, not, not all of them. There's a lot. <clears throat> Talking about the here and now. Yes, this morning in the Times, there was a story about how you and those other two blokes that you've been doing the Grand Tour with mm -hmm. are giving up. Is this true? Oh, the stories about that every week. I mean, they're <laughs> old, really, really old, one of them. So, I mean, yeah, no offence. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I don't know. Uh, of course, it'll end one day, but who knows when that day comes. Uh, we'll right. decide. What about, um, do, you, do you ever consider life without it? No. Without what? Without the without the Grand Tour, without the oh, other that, two plonkers. I, I have been 23 <laughs> years. <laughs> years ago, we were standing in a... I think we might have been at the office, the old office, where that came from. Yeah. Um, and I was making my breakfast. I was just spreading my Marmite on my toast quite happily with my coffee cooling beside me. And all of a sudden, from behind me, James May erupts. Sack of the way you spread your Marmite on your toast in the morning. Well, the way you take it right up to the edges and then you clean the knife in the... Mate, if the way I make my breakfast is causing you to be that cross, we've spent too much time together. See what you mean. We have, we have spent a long time. To, but it's it turned into a career. Mm. I didn't think it would last. I thought... I mean, I'd always wanted to do car shows. That had always been my aim. And when I got the gig on Top Gear in 20... Yeah, 2000, wasn't it? Um, I thought, oh, brilliant, I might get a couple of series out of this. Fantastic. I didn't think I'd still be working with them 23 years Yeah, later. yeah. How did you get the gig? Charm. Charm, yeah, wit, yeah. Okay. Um, we we'll make it like intellect. <laughs> no, it was, I got I got a phone call from my then agent because I was doing car shows on Granada Men and Motors, if you remember. Ah, those. you were, yeah. Intellectually right. driven, high-end production. High-end. Yeah. Uh, and I got a call from my agent and she said, Rich, you've got an audition. They're relaunching Top Gear. Um, you won't get it, but you should go along anyway because it'd be good to meet them. So I, I drove along, lived in Cheltenham at the time. And I just learned from my wife that we were going to have a baby. So I thought, I need a four-seater. So I chopped in my little Fiat Barchetta, which I loved. Um, for absolutely ruined, ratty old left-hand drive, 1982, I think it was, 911 SC which I just adored. It leaked. It was permanently on the point of exploding and ruining me. And it, it steamed up even in summer. I loved it. So I arrived in my left. So as soon as I arrived in that, they thought, oh, hello. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's, he's, this is real. Um, and I did my audition with Jeremy and I met Richard Porter, you know, yeah. um, and Andy Willman. A lot of people are still with us and thought, I remember when it came time to leave. I said, right, I've got to go now. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to go back to the NAM, Cheltenham. And Jeremy and Wilm, they've always said, <laughs> oh, they've always said that's why I got the job. <laughs> Just because I lived in Cheltenham and I called it the NAM. <laughs> so they gave me the gig. I but I've always been lucky with getting jobs for weird reasons. Uh, we were talked before about how I'd worked in radio for 10 years. I was literally starving to death. I'd, the point What, came, as a reporter or, or as a, a presenter? presenter? Good morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is an old school radio presenter. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I wanted to do car stuff. I'd done the odd car review on the radio, but I'd reached the point where I went to Quicksave in Clitheroe for my weekly shop, and my overdraft was completely full, and my credit card was completely full. I couldn't buy any food, and I went back to the house I shared with a load of people from the radio station. Well, I don't know what to do now. I, I sort of starve, I presume. So I'd gone, I used to keep my motorcycle, GSXR 750 WP, um, in the shed behind the pub over the road. So I went over and opened the shed door and I swear the bike just hid at the back of the shed. I just saw these two headlights. <laughs> no, not me. And I rode it to Accrington Stanley. 
Ac- Ac- Accrington rather Accrington Stanley is a football team I yep. rode it to Accrington down the road and went around all the dealers and whichever one would give me the most cash sold it mm. and I realised this has to change sorry state so I applied for a job at Renault UK in the press office yep and we met when I was doing press Jacko yep. yep and Tim Jackson yep interviewed me for that and I got how the job how come he gave you the job well he gave me that job because all the way through the interview he'd been sitting there mm-hmm, 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 taking notes a lot of notes once I'd got the job, he showed me the notes. I'd worn a pair of shoes that had laces and buckles on, which is quite unusual back then. This is 30 years ago or something. And he'd spent the whole of the interview sketching them. Because <laughs> really? it was so unusual. <laughs> <laughs> he was so interested in it, they're really unusual. Uh, so he gave me the job. He was kind of unusual himself, wasn't he? Uh, he was a legend and I adored the man. I resigned twice because I got the job at Renault expressly to get to know the editors of the car shows. Uh, and I got to know Pete Baker. Did you ever meet him? Yeah. When he was running Granada Men and Motors. Um, and Pete said, look, I can't get... I'd done a showreel for him on my company car with my mate. We'd filmed What, it. just yourself? Yeah, Mate, oh, well. yeah. I've just done a little piece on my company car, and he said, "Yeah, all right. Well, I can't guarantee you a lot, but you um, you might get a day a week or a day every other week for one hundred and twenty five pounds a day." Mm. Um, so I thought, well, that's it. I've got to go back to broadcasting. That's where my heart is, and that is a car show. So I went and resigned, and there were tears in both our eyes. Yeah, in fact, I then thought about it over the weekend. Came in the next Monday and said, "I can't leave Tim because we had such a lovely time." But then by the end of the week, I thought, "No, I've got to go back." to what I do which is broadcasting so I did resign I loved working for him and he was a that he was he gave I had a long termer which was a 1912 Renault for about nine months in my shed at reposed courtesy of Jacko this veteran car you had a ni- 1912 <laughs> long term well they had this spare car and they didn't know what to do with it and oh, so I, they were just storing it. it in your shed basically well I liked yeah. having it <laughs> So, uh, no, You're probably the only one who could operate the bloody thing. Well, indeed, but Jacko is the only man. Sure, everyone was new. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I remember when they launched these. Yeah, <laughs> I remember was, these brand new. I was quite old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tim was just a legend, one of the nicest men in the motor industry, and you, you'll you'll never find anybody that will say anything no. contrary to that. But he did a lot, didn't he? Yeah. He propelled road motorsport. And oh my God, Renault's motorsport efforts. Yeah, him and Simon North. Oh God, yeah, because when I was there. Is when we launched the Renault Spider. Do you remember that? Mm. <laughs> Just as the Lotus at least came, it was oh, brilliant. <laughs> same time. Absolutely blown up. Yeah. They did the same later with the Scenic and the Picnic. Oh yeah, Toyota Picnic came out same time as the Scenic. Yeah, my mid-size MPV didn't really prosper. No, it didn't go anywhere. But um, name like that, God. yeah, it's not ideal. They haven't repeated the Picnic, have they? Yeah, no. it, it, um, it's not a brilliant name. It's not no. snappy. It's not as good as the Bongo Friendy, but it's still, it's still not a brilliant name. But yeah, Tim was instrumental in actually getting Jason Plato's career off the ground. Because Plato was doing a bit of racing. He stepped up to do the Spider series. And then racing for us, still when I was in the PR side of it, Alain Menu and Will Hoy in the Laguna in BTCC. Um, Will Hoy passed, didn't he? Um, and then Plato got the drive in BTCC, which was instrumental in his career. Yeah, big deal. And then he Still stole a job on television from me. Yeah. Did, did he steal a job? God, I was cross. <laughs> yeah. I was at Granada Men and Motors. So I right. dropped out of Renault by then, back into broadcast. Okay. Doing a little car show for 50 pence an episode. 5p of which went to me. Huh. Um, and they were auditioning for, which yeah. was it? Was, was it, it Driven? Driven? It was Driven. Driven, yeah. I went for an audition. Later That's heard Jason Plato got it. Yeah. So you did, did I was you cross over? The, yeah, yeah, I was working on the website. Yeah, oh, right. to support so it at the time. Yeah, so when, with, when, yeah, Plato when got, it was driven and deals on wheels were the two. Yeah, when Plato, yeah, so when Jason Plato got that gig, I'd been for it, and he yeah. got it. I was fuming. I didn't hold back. We didn't speak for quite a long time. <laughs> really, I and mean, we're all mates again now. Yeah. But I, it was because um, he was a racing driver. Yeah, he's got a job. Yeah, he's got a I job. was already a television presenter yeah. Yeah. and a journalist. Mm. And they, I think what I said quite loudly in a bar was, "Well, if you wanted somebody to land a jet aircraft, you wouldn't ask." A dentist would you <laughs> so why would you get somebody who can do it I was really cross yeah yeah you yeah. viewed maybe still do presenting radio and TV as something of a craft is that fair I take that view of it yes I'm a bit old fashioned um, because I think if you're a presenter you're one of a number of tools in the box mm. 
towards making that that you're creating, whether it's lighting, camera, sound, production, editing, doesn't matter. You're one of the pieces of that puzzle and there are skills and there is a craft to learn to play your role in that. It's different from the modern era in which what they really want is personalities. They want big, big, loud personalities. I'm not, I don't fall into that category. Mm. I'm far happier when I've got, you know, crew around me and something to tell you about, some information to impart. If I tell you this about it, it's even more interesting. It's not about me, but the modern style of presenting is more, hey, this is my funny take on this, mm. or this is how much I already know about this. It's, you're presenting yourself, whereas I'd rather present that that I'm there to present along with the rest of the team. But that I'm a dying breed. <laughs> this is completely the wrong way of doing this. Do you, you had a, you were setting off, you were sort of away, away from cars a bit, weren't you? Presenting wise, do you do you do you, do you seek that stuff or? Uh, no, I mean I've always done that because I started as a sort of general radio presenter. Yes. Then I got into television to do cars, which is you know that is my cars and motorcycles, my absolute passion. I'd always be pursuing that anyway. But as a broadcaster, yeah, I've done loads of all sorts of different stuff. I love it. I really enjoy the the business of it. Yeah, and I run a production company now that makes my TV shows and others and Drive Tribe that I now own and operate. That again, we create a lot of media. I love the process of the business; it's fascinating. Tell us about—I'm not clear on Drive Tribe was a thing that was fronted by the three of you when you were. It was at Top Gear. It was yeah, all three of us. Uh, it went through various iterations. It was app based mostly. That's right. Um, and the app cost a fortune to run. Along came a pandemic, and all the money disappeared from the industry. Right. Nobody had any money to spend. Couldn't run the app anymore. But I took it on because I, there was something in the business that I thought, actually, no, it's creating a community, a sense of place for like-minded people to gather, whether your enthusiasm is for drifting in Japanese cars or vintage car trialing or modern cheap cars, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a nice place to gather around for that. And there were some really talented people in it. So I took them with me and we, we relaunched the business. And, it's and that's now, gathered momentum, isn't it? Oh, my God, yeah. It's, not surprisingly, because if you think about it, Oh God, I've God, I've gone through this so many times, but it's, it is true. You know, the car, when it was invented, back when you were young, um, was, was a novelty for rich people. And it really was. Oh, look, Carruthers is coming up the driver. There's no horse in front of his carriage. How's he doing that? Ha, ha, ha. That's all it was. And people quickly realised, wait a minute, this could catch on. The RAC was formed. They built a palace to it. And it became the thing that enabled and therefore defined our lives and our world, mm. that level of motability for people. And now it's undergoing a reinvention. At this time round, we know how significant it is. It began as a novelty. Well, it quietly caught on. This time, we're changing something that shaped our world. So... Any opportunity to share views on that, to share enthusiasms for it, to share issues. If you think about it, when in the, hmm, 20 years ago you were writing about cars, let's be honest. I mean, it might have had a different shape, um, door was, handle, or yeah. I mean, you ten, remember, ten, ten bigger, ten percent faster, ten percent yeah, more efficient, was, you ten percent more expensive. Your desk and and was what it. am yeah. I going to say about <laughs> this? I used to write the press releases at Renault. Yeah, imagine. What are you going to say? There was. There was nothing really. You were yep. you were at best able to advise people on what to buy. I know you know, well you found it what car was sort of is intertwined with your past. That, that all of those that was a useful service because you'd driven everything and you could say, yeah, it might be better suited to somebody with a long, young family or whatever. But that was all we could do. Whereas now there are fundamental shifts in the industry and in the yeah. way it conducts itself in the concept of car ownership and also in terms of global resources. It's a massively important subject. So media, be it print magazines, be it internet, podcasts, whatever, is really important. It's a vitally important subject to us all. Yeah, I've got this bee in my bonnet about just at the moment. This business of explaining things is actually more important now than it's mm. ever been. Yeah. Just because... You. because People have to catch up. I was in a, an event not so long ago when the one of the um, panelists was saying that the, you know, we're always berating the companies for for not proceeding quickly enough, but the but the people who aren't proceeding quickly enough are the customers. Yeah, because we have to we have to be educated. There is no doubt the car will go into the future. Technology will save us in a myriad other ways. I mean, there are other things we can be doing, by the way, beyond thinking about our car. Maybe not buying a new pair of trainers every six months that's been made by somebody else's children on the other side of the world would be a good idea. But in terms of the car, it's not going to be solely electric. It 
can't be. There isn't enough cobalt and lithium in the world to do it. Um, and it also demands people buying and therefore having made new cars, which is very expensive in terms of carbon footprint. Yeah. So there will be other things. There will be hydrogen combustion. That's coming. So as customers, we need to know what's the difference between a full electric and yeah. a hybrid electric, between a hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen combustion, between a restored internal combustion engine car running on fossil and running on synthetic. We There's there's a lot to know about as there customers. Is, yeah, yeah. If we're going to be useful in shaping our own future, which have we you, have an essential role in. Have you driven many, um, you're probably pretty busy at the moment running a business, but but have you driven many EVs? I mean, the yeah. sort of latest. Yeah, I, you make I, I had a Tesla Model X, which I loved, mostly because of the doors. That was your smoker, was it? Your car? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the doors. Okay. Problem I have, I live out in Herefordshire, and um, everywhere's a long way away. <laughs> yeah. It gets really difficult. Um, I had um, a EQS, Mercedes. I bought that because I had a long range. It was a, they're amazing devices. I'll be quite honest, as an ownership prospect for me, they just don't excite because of their solid state. I still get a thrill from the fact that an internal combustion engine car works in ways I can understand. It works with well, a simple chemical reaction at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few explosions, it, nothing it, like a few explosions. It, and it, it works in ways I can comprehend, <laughs> so I get excited about them. Yeah. Um, which is why I'm particularly excited about things like synthetic fuel, which, okay, I think they've got it to about six um, euros a litre now, but that's not at scale. Um, <clears throat> there is a big call for it to be labelled more clearly as to how renewably produced it is, and that's important that we know as consumers, can I run my 67 Mustang 390 GT with a completely clear conscience? Look my daughters in the eye. And Have you got one? Yeah. You know, I thought you did. I it's, a, it's original colour. We need you to run through your stable in a sec. What is your daily smoker? What did you come in to today? A uh, truck. <laughs> Which is? Wild truck. Ranger. Ah, ah of course. Um, oh, yeah. I, I yeah, remember that the blokes at Ford were all cock a hoop because you bought that thing. I bloody bought it full price as well. I didn't yeah. get any deal on it. Can we be quite clear? <laughs> um, yeah, because it, it works for the truck. And I use that to but they, around. I it. remember them running around <clears throat> sort of busting their whatnots to, get, to deliver it quickly because you were... You were, you were so keen. And we've beaten the hell out of it ever since. Um, so I use that, especially for salt near the roads. But my daily drive, otherwise, um, I've gone full midlife crisis spec. Come on. Well, you know, I, I love a 911 yep. because they're built to use, built to work. They're not built to sit and talk about it in pubs. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not they're not they're not sold by the manufacturer so they can sell more hats with the car badge on uh, they're built because they're bloody amazing and they function um so i i, I finally th i need to go back and get myself an i11 on 53 i need it now um so i bought gts correct nice yeah two wheel drive yeah. lovely perfect convertible okay the one thing i've said all are we talking 911 gts cabriolet we which modern, the yeah. late, latest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, Full right. midlife crisis spec. Roof down, shades on, I'm 53. Get on, get on with it. It's your problem, not Well, it probably plays well with your other half, does it? Um, no. <laughs> not really, no. No. Um, so, they're pretty rigid, aren't they? The soft top 911s are. Oh, you, you, know, oh, you wouldn't you'd hardly know. Unless you're putting it on yeah. a track. And I'm not, I, yeah. I'm not taking my car on a track. I'll use somebody else's. Yeah. Because I'll crash it. <laughs> um, so I'll use that daily. So truck, 911. What else? Uh, Land Rover X Tech 110 utility. Uh, oh, is that the one outside? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a nice machine. It's a lo I love that. How is, it? How is it? You've it, done some tweaks. Yeah, that I had Bowler uh, worked on that for me years ago. They gave it more power, and as a result, um, the transfer box final drive <laughs> completely <laughs> wrecks itself all the time. The other favourite daily driver is Subaru Impreza WRX. STI that I drove on the Grand Tour, I've had breathed on. That's now putting out four hundred five hundred and forty. So you, you, you would normally in a Grand Tour vehicle would float away somewhere else, but you kept it. Um, I've kept a few of them, yeah. So I mean, of the Grand Tour ones, I've kept. There's a few outside, aren't there? Yeah, I've kept that. Uh, I've kept another one that I can't talk about from a recent one. Oh, and <laughs> another one from a recent one. I've <laughs> kept the last two from the last two that I've just done. Uh, I've also kept the Buick. Uh, boat tail. Oh yes, Riviera. Yeah. Um, I want to do something with that in the future. <laughs> These yeah. cars, crazy cars. And then of my nice, I got a '62 E-Type Cabriolet, uh, OTS rather. 60. That's the one that was done yeah. by your 
jumps down. And then I have a 62E type coupe that I want to get done by these guys. And one day I'd love us to do to the ultimate degree. So it's dark opalescent and blue. It's, I mean, it's a runner now. No, no, we've, I've, I've stripped it, but it needs, needs carefully restoring to be a show winner. Uh, then I've got a 30. Can you produce show winners here? Is it, yeah, is that, perfectly the, is that the plan? Yeah. I want to, I want to replace that, which is the joke one, the nice try award from the Festival of the Unexceptional. Yeah. With, I want to, I've seen you at concourse competitions. I want you to come and judge one of my cars. Mate, and I'll say, be a... That is up to scratch. And we will take the judgment. Yeah. All right. I want to actually say. I want to, I just want to see you in a Panama hat. I've got a Panama <laughs> hat. Not, well, Steve, not just a Panama hat. I'm going to have like a jacket and suit. Oh, of course, okay, of course. The full sartorial, yeah, I get it. <laughs> it scared me then. Um, no, I think I want us to be judged on the merits of our work. Because I'm on the telly, it can skew things. And I've used it openly. Um, the, you know, we've got ourselves a, a car at a show because I'm it's Richard Hammond off the telly. But I want them to say, can we have your car at our show? Because it's amazing. It's a beautiful piece of work yeah. and people want to see it. So I have a, a plan to make that Ascot RS2000 <sighs> that didn't sell because I put the wrong color interior in it, rushed the paintwork and didn't re-register it. I want us to do that here. It's unpaid, remember, because it's my car. So yeah. it costs me to do it. But that investment in time and having the guys do that means we've got our own show car. Yeah. So any event, we take that along. and those a lovely show car. Yeah, those who know it will go. Yeah. But I need I need to get it to the standard where you could look at it and go it with your all your ticks proper. Yeah, and go yeah. Do you know what? That's a that's a top notch car. Yeah, right. Talk to us about the uh, you were you, just before we started talking into these microphones. You you were um, are we being recorded? I believe so. Jeez, <laughs> have we told you? Said. See that thing in front of you? Yes. That's what we call a microphone. Oh, you can shake the words out of it yeah, at the, the end. I've seen it. those. Yeah. Um, no, you were talking about the, the the difficulty or what you've learned in running a business, which, which is not uh, particularly consistent with what you were doing before. Yeah. yeah tell tell us about that. Well, it's really hard because... I mean, you employ people, for instance. Or yes. Um, I'm not a manager by nature. I'm a television presenter, but loosely a journalist, um, and a car enthusiast that doesn't add up to somebody who can necessarily manage a business. Um, I'm not very good at detail. I'm very good at dancing in here with a big crazy idea. I know we should do this. And then hopefully other people make it happen. But of course, 20 odd years of being in quite big television, we have been, I, I'm always there for the big exciting, hey, let's do this conversation. Let's go there. Let's have this adventure in these cars. Yeah. But then I can step away and somebody else does all the making it happen. Yeah. Um, I've got to do that bit as well now. So it's really, really difficult. Uh, and, and there I, was an excellent bit on the radio. I, th I think I was listening to TalkSport or something, and there was a, there was some puff for, for your your television program, and then there was an excellent bit where some a, th a lady, some woman, has, says to you, you don't know much about anything, do you? And you said, <laughs> and, and then <laughs> you kind of agreed, and you yeah. said, yes, well, I know about cars. Found out. Yeah, cars I do know yeah. about. Um, but it, it's also learning lessons like... And I've had this told me by so many people running businesses similar to mine, only successful, uh, that it's, it's, it's customers. It's just about the customers because they come to us with their car. They have a budget in mind for that car. Obviously, they want the dream car. But what they sometimes forget is all these guys and all I want to do is make the dream car. But their budget might not be big enough to do mm. that. Their budget at that point becomes my budget. Mm. So it's it's like I own their car and I dream of it being perfect, but I don't have the money in my budget to achieve that. And we have to be realistic, which is why I still feel we haven't really had the opportunity to take a car to that level. Yeah. Which is why I need to do it on a car that doesn't have a budget because it's our car. I've got it in a barn. Yeah. And we'll just do that RS to the nth degree and to hell with it it could cost me because I'll have to make up the shortfall when the business doesn't make enough to cover the hours but fair dues the business will then have that show car mm. do, do people now come just come to the door and say hello I've got a Morris 8 that I need to be yeah. restored yeah I mean they also contact us at the website I could fill the next three years of work and I'm thinking in my mind at some point I really want to expand this because I can't stress enough I love making a TV show about it. It's, of course, I do. that's what I do. But I love putting the word out there that, you know, these things are still alive. This is still a passion. It's still a flame that's deserving of, of oxygen. 
Um, and it still has a part to play in our broader future. It really does. Classic cars, they're already made. There's 1.4 billion of them on the road. Let's not throw them away. Let's use them. Yeah. Um, so it's important. And I'd like I'd like to reach a point where I could expand this business and make it bigger. I'd like to be able to take on more work. I'd like to see more cars that would otherwise end up scrapped and ultimately the other end of the chain replaced by something new. I'd like to see them. But your Fiesta ideas. idea is a good one. I'd love to. For most young people, they'd love a really cool retro car. It look really groovy. And you can make seat materials and dash, dashboard materials out of bamboo or hemp yeah. or a so, million yeah. things now yeah, yeah. to make it entirely renewable and say there you go that for you young person is probably the greenest thing you could possibly do when it comes to personal transport you've made what would it's meant to and meant what would constitute expansion would you would it be taking over some more of this building yeah maybe a, a bigger building somewhere would you would you want to stay in the area or yeah i like it in hereford i love herefordshire mm. it's back of beyond but it's great it's oh it's great though, it's slightly it? crazy out here it's also it's 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 far enough from London that it doesn't empty out on a Monday morning. Um, I told you when you arrived, Steve, tonight's my beer night with the boys at the Alma down the road in Linton. Who, just list them again. Farmer, oh, helicopter pilot. We've got pilot. farmer, helicopter pilot, another f- do different types of farmer, a guy who runs a business making the sides for barns. Hi, Jim. Um, <laughs> builders. It's just a really disparate bunch of people and we all meet up because we all like each other and we're mates. And that's, um, it's, a lo- it, it's your local. And that's typical of this county. I'm not just living here with a load of bankers and television presenters. Nothing against bankers and television presenters. Um, but it's a fine county. So, no, we'll keep the business here and is setting up here and doing this is one of the reasons that you like spending time here and it gives you more opportunity to be around yeah it's, it's, I mean, it is ruining me let's be under no illusion <laughs> you you commented when you came in about how you know, big and professional the place is I mean, those are it's serious amounts of kit we've got here i know because i had to sell half of my car collection to buy them so i sold i don't like i sold a 69 911t I sold a Bentley S1, two owners from new. I sold a Lotus Esprit uh, 350 Sport. Ah. I sold a Guzzy Le Mans Mark II, uh, a Norton Dommy Racer. I sold all of these things to buy kits so that I could restore other people's cars, often at my own expense. Mm. Still got a lot of bikes? Oh, I've got a lot of bikes. Oh, is it that the, is it, what's the, um, the Stafford? Oh, no, I think Stafford you were there. You brilliant. were there with, um, with James May. May yeah, you, we sold we sold, sold some of after, really well after bleeding um, stuff on offer was from you guys. Yeah, well, every now and again we have a clear out. He's he's diminished his quite a lot. I can't resist a motorbike. I just can't. I'm more, if I'm honest, and I'll whisper this, I'm more bikes than cars for me. Mm-hmm. Just because because. You know how I get quite romantic about cars and so because they enable everything beyond your cave, they enable your life, they move us bodily so they move us emotionally. Apply that to a motorcycle, which you operate with your whole body. You don't sit in and operate with controls. You steer it with your head, your shoulders, your balls, your knees, your feet. You operate it bodily. So it's a much closer relationship. And are you also on your own? Mm. So for me, when I get on a bike and ride out, it's like there's permanently a 17-year-old version of me somewhere out there on a bike. And when I get on a bike, I inhabit that version of me. And it's the most wonderful, freeing, important sensation in my life. So yeah, I've got a lot of bikes, going back to the 1920s. Very nice. I can't resist a bike. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. Your knowledge of cars Mm. and bikes, well, and engineering in general, that authenticity is quite important on the telly isn't it in a way when you're doing car I think it's absolutely critical I think we're not just with car shows with anything Matt I think um, enthusiasm and and authenticity and knowledge is immensely compelling to viewers Mm. so on a car show it's got to be in your blood we always said about Top Gear Grand Tour you don't have to be a car nerd to watch it we do that for you Mm. and it's the examples I always come up with are you know Bake Off and that one where they throw pots who gives a crap about baking and pottery, really? I, I'm, I'm sure maybe you do, but I, I don't. No. But I'll watch the shows yeah. because the people on it really do. And it's compelling. And you can tell the yeah. knowledge, the enthusiasm, the passion is there. It's real. Certainty and, is and, it. And, and, and I, I yeah. will watch that. that. That guy who cries when somebody throws a really nice pot. <laughs> well, I wouldn't, but I'm amazed that he does. And I find that incredibly yeah. compelling to watch. So, yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. I think it's really important. 
What about other shows? Can you see, do you have other plans down the road or is it, I mean, this this is obviously, this can run as long as you want it to run, I imagine. It takes, tends to take all of the time. Um, yeah. Other shows for me, I'd love to, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say long-term broadcast. It's, it's 30, 36 years I've been, or 35 years now. Right. 1988 I started, so 35 years I've been in broadcasting with a break for PR, which I was crap. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll never, I'll never. Nobody else said that, Richard. Oh, they really did. I was rubbish. I really was. I was the worst PR man, honestly. Hopeless. Tim will tell you. Well, he won't. He's gone now, sadly. Well, yeah. that's well that, you're lucky. Industry. He's, you know, Tim. Tim's departed, so he not he, he can't tell. He the can't story, tell can the he? truth of how <laughs> genuinely useless I was as a, a PR. Guy. Um, yeah, of course, I'll always do broadcasting, and that, you know, there's always other ideas. But right now, I'm, my time is filled with Drive Tribe, with the smallest cog with Chimp making the TV show about the smallest cog, there's not a lot of spare time. No, sure enough. But I'm like you, I like to be busy. Yeah. Many times, I, uh, when you were sitting down, he said he's gonna slow down, because as he gets closer to 100, you usually do. But not even happening. He's, no, he's sort of not. supposed to, and then on his days off, he comes to mind and we record a podcast. You know what happens? <laughs> you know what happens? He makes up his mind to slow down a bit, and then he forgets. <laughs> <laughs> There was something I was going to do, well, wasn't there? I, can't well, I can't remember. Was, I was just carry on. I'm going to talk about cars all day. I <laughs> <That was laughs> completely <laughs> forgot. That is kind of it, mate. Yeah, turns yeah. Out, nobody telling me retired last <laughs> week. <laughs> It'll upset him that he, he does say so, you do say, Steve. But I'm, I'm the same as you. You can't stop. No. Why would you? Why would you not do what you do? Uh, well, somebody might tell me to stop. I'd have to read about somebody else's bloody week in auto car every week, and I don't. Might be. I might well, not you want can read to read about one. his week first. Okay, I'll do that. Just take it over. Yeah. No, um, no. Have you taken well, it over I, now? No, no. I've got Jesus. a column, but not, I'm not doing You're not his. doing his? No, 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 no. No, no, no. What on this week? What because... week in cars? Yeah. We used every week at Top Gear. That was open and looked at. Fantastic. Saw a maxi this week. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help but remember. <laughs> That's how we used to bend in the middle if you car. open all the doors <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> it was the highlight of the week. We yeah, thought. yeah. That and Anthony French Constant's introductions wow. when he was trying to get a thousand oh, words out, 998 words of which were the, <laughs> were the intro. We <laughs> used to love that. Those are our two. Uh, they were the two articles we always read. What was he? What, was he writing for Car then? He was in Car. Right? Car. Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, we yeah. AFC's introductions on what week in cars. That's uh, that. That was that was our. Oh well, I knew good. somebody read it. It was us. Good. Oh, well, good. But there's three, three there. Yeah, there's a. It'd be nice to get to double figures, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, steady. Yeah. <laughs> Don't overdo it. It spoils uh, it when you get an audience that big. But it, I, there's no doubting. There's there's never been a more exciting time to be in and around automotive journalism because there's never been a more dynamic and shifting time for the subject, and it's never been more important. Yeah. We're not gonna. Well. The only horrific outcome would be if we did modify our lives so that we didn't need to move around physically, and that's a horrible prospect. It is. Yeah. Did you guys ever ever get much earache from from car companies when you played somewhat fast and loose with their products? Do you mean when I crashed them, or do you well, mean no, when no, Jeremy no, was just, rude just about them? I mean, you were pretty rude about them at times. Yeah. Well, uh, not me. My mates. <laughs> so I don't like being in trouble. I, I don't enjoy the sensation of being in trouble. Yeah, it's, used, it's, to when I, used to when I was at school. Yeah. But since becoming a, nearly an adult, no, I don't like it. That's interesting because you're, you know, you've got this kind of, um, uh, you know, part of your persona is is energy, you know, so to say what you like, that kind of stuff. I, no, I'm energetic, but I'm not. No, I don't. The other two on the, the car shows to which you refer yep. they enjoy being in trouble they love it and and, and I know the feeling they mean because when I was at school I used to think wow somebody somewhere in the staff room is going on about me and it's going to reach the headmaster's office and I'm going to be called in and shout I used to like that yeah. as a grown up I hate it I hate doing the wrong thing I hate being in trouble no I'm not uh, comfortable with it uh, interesting it's just my mates do so I often was yeah so I suppose you can buy association and all that oh yeah 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 but people people have always done that I, mean, I remember <laughs> people come in and say oh well you know what you lot are like about women and cars what what yeah. have we ever said never yeah. we wouldn't well indeed but, but people they make just assumptions make, they're exactly they? right they're filling yeah. the gaps tell us about your relationship with those two blokes uh, you, I mean do you like them do you, do yeah, you spend yeah, any yeah. time with them well, we, spent a, well we, we used to be asked that a lot when we were the, the most intensive times when we were doing you know the top gear when we were doing two series a year you see somebody more just work just happened somebody Don't, just dropped a rear axle it means yeah but for them to drop a rear axle they must have been lifting a rear axle <laughs> which means they were working 
<laughs> up to the point when they were crushed. <laughs> well, there's been then no, some, somebody there's else been no has screams. to work. Somebody's got to get the, the accident book out and fill that in. That's just it's not bring the ambulance. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's not billable though. <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, well, no, tell us the, the, your relationship with the other two. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, we, I, mean yeah. I did perceive, I, I saw, for instance, on your website, there's a picture of James standing up, James May standing out the front. No, I was saying that I, I was mean, banishing. He's, so he's come for the royal visit. No, I was throwing him out. Ah. I, I'm still desperate to get banned from his pub. Okay. No, we, we are, mates. Of course we are, because we, we've spent thousands of hours together all around the world in glaciers, jungles, forests, deserts. Um, of course we're mates. We, I, when we were asked at the height of it, oh, do you meet up when you're not working? Well, that, we'd have to actually share a house to meet any more yeah. than we did. Um, so, yeah, we're mates. We still regularly call. And, in fact, James called me just as you were arriving. Yeah, we talk regularly. Of course we are. And we argue and fight. Yeah. But we know each other well enough that it just, just happens. Well, you do that on screen a bit, don't well, you? Well, yes, exactly right. We made, we made a, um, uh, a merit out of arguing and failing. That's our biggest strength, so arguing and failing at things. Yeah. How much of when you're on a trip like that, I, I know a certain amount is scripted, a certain amount is not scripted, and the funny things will happen when they mm. just happen. What proportion of it is being filmed at a time? I mean, do you, does, as soon as you get in a car in the morning, do the camera oh, roll yeah, and yeah, stay it's, rolling it's, for the whole day? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's tens of thousands of hours of stuff that go into it. It has to be, because... Right back to the Top Gear days when we were making the first specials, they were expensive. And this is just license fee payers' money back then. Um, so we couldn't just say, yeah, we're going to go to Burma and hope something funny happens or something exciting. You can't, you had to write it. So we'd say, we're going to wherever we're going, Mongolia, to do this. But this that we'd written would be the least of it. Obviously, we knew that 95% of what went into the show would be stuff that happened spontaneously. Sponta spontaneously yeah. but you can't guarantee that not when you're spending that kind of money so we'd write it and then throw all the stuff away and a typical example in one day uh, when we were filming in Scotland we did a lockdown special called Lockdown it's clever Very good. Ch. Love um, it. I didn't think of it and uh, in just one day Jeremy's caravan came off the back of his car that wasn't a stunt it just happened and overtook him through the woods and crash <laughs> Uh, and I sank somebody's fishing boat that we'd borrowed spontaneously again that just happened and we did say God we are lucky mm. that I mean we'd have had a good day's film we had some stuff written in but all of that went in the bin because the real stuff is what makes the show yeah but the, I, I seem to remember this fishing boat sinking was that shown on a box yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, yeah. those are the again if something goes wrong it's they're, great. The, they're the best bits that's why there were never any outtakes from that show oh, I see because if one of us fell over or shut their hand in a door or got something wrong that's going in because that's the best bit there was one bit that I'd, I always thought of, I mean you put yourself it, apart from the, the well um, known accidents of which there have been <laughs> a few yeah no I haven't but, crashed but this you, desk yet but there was <laughs> no there, um, there were some places where you really put yourself in danger I seem to remember you guys being at you know, sort of 27,000 feet up some mountain when you couldn't mm. breathe. And, that, you know, altitude sickness was... That was on the Altiplano in Bolivia, down to the Atacama that looked, Desert. That looked yeah, it was, quite, it was quite unpleasant. It made no more pleasant for me by the fact that I was in an ancient land cruiser with no clutch or brakes. Like, none. <laughs> and it wasn't a, for effect. I'm not saying that some members of our crew will sometimes make a fuss. <clears throat> However, uh, I'd said to the engineers, I've got no clutch or brakes. The only way to start it was low ratio first in gear and crank it in gear so yeah. that it will pull away and then shift clutchlessly and then to cut, just kill the ignition. Lord. And I'd driven it for days through the jungle like that. It wasn't until an engineer got in and said, you can't drive this, it's got no clutch or brakes. I know, <laughs> that's what I've been saying. Um, yeah, that was a horrific trip. Richard yeah. Porter was very generous about you on his pod the other day, saying that you drove down... You drove a bunch of the crew down, including him. He said it was one of the most skilled things he's done in a car that you had not binned off the side Me? of a mountain. Yeah, I was skilled. You were driving. Sure? Yes, I, I swear. Yeah. Well, was he was he sober when he said this he nice was, thing well, about? I don't know. When he was recording his podcast, he comes sober. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a fairly sober but, sort yeah. of chap, is Porter. Yeah. Well, we saw him at the RSC the other day as well. Oh, yeah. He was in good form. But that's yeah, that's a nice example of somebody we've worked with forever. I like. I do enjoy that. Actually, the whole car industry if you took out the manufacturers themselves it's a monumental industry but you could get it in a room with not that many people yeah in no. this country no it's true 
Yeah, it's a, it's a funny circle, isn't it? Mm. That's right. Yeah. Freaks and weirdos, a lot of us. Luckily, we're propelled by the people at the other end of this microphone. <laughs> yeah, does that help? The thing it's the, the, in fact, it's a, it's a problem that some, some people have got, I think, isn't it? That they, they kind of forget the power of the audience. Yeah, well, that's, know, we're dead without them, kind of thing. Yeah, 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 and we're part of it, and we're you know, it, it is uh, as viewers and consumers of content, we are consumers, and we will get what we want. That's that's the point of it. Yeah, um, yeah. that's how it works. Were you it's, surprised at the success of Top Gear? No, were, were you ever not surprised? No, we were continuing massive, success. Massive right? surprise. It was ridiculous. We just set out to make the best car show we could. I remember the first meetings at White City BBC offices, um, and us sitting around, and we said, "Right, let's establish the ground rules for new Top Gear." Rule one. No supercars, only cars that people actually buy, normal cars. Rule two, no foreign travel. We're not going off around the world. We're only doing <laughs> sense. <laughs> so we, we didn't entirely stick to that. But we, we just set out to make the best car show we could. That was honestly some total of ambition right the way through. And the way it was, it, the content was, was just a bunch of you sitting around in an office yeah. making notes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it was yeah. it was a great atmosphere you could lob in anything because I uh, and you will have this with magazines with newspapers with any creative endeavor once it's been going for a while you know the kinds of ideas broadly that'll fit it and the kinds of ideas that might be good ideas but simply wouldn't they wouldn't fit right in there they need to go somewhere else yeah yeah so we've reached that point where very few completely inappropriate ideas were bowled in by any member of the team they they would fit because it had a flavor of its own Give us an idea about the the way th the engineering that went on, because you know we're all aware, those of us that have tried to mend our own cars a few times, that that a certain amount of damage gets sustained by these vehicles, and then mysteriously they appear next day looking lovely. There's no mystery. <laughs> we do it ourselves. <laughs> Up all night with a toolkit, eh? I have welded a wishbone back onto a Subaru in the middle of a desert somewhere myself, actually, yeah. Yeah. in order to make it to camp that night. It's a mix. I mean, there are genuinely occasions when we do have to get stuck in, because if you've got to make camp, and wherever we're camping is eight hours away, and something's just dropped off, you've got to sort it. Yeah. Certainly in terms of the engineering, as in some of the big builds, where I like it when we say, so overnight we built this <laughs> massive bridge. Um, a lot of it is done by that guy next door, Adrian Spooner at HMS Engineering. So the bigger builds... How did you... Is that just a relationship that grew because you know him? Yeah, I've known him through... I, I was doing engineering shows years ago, years and years ago, did a thing called Engineering Connections, uh, and there were a lot of builds for that, and he's a TV, used to TV engineering. He's used to the fact that it's got to work... But sometimes it's got to look a bit shonky, or it maybe it's got to look like we built it. Yeah, I got so it. So he wants to finish it perfectly, but no, it's got to look like we lashed it together. So, yeah. Um, Somebody showed up outside the auto car offices years ago from Top Gear, from the Top mm. Gear show, with some contraption. Oh. This is strange. Do you remember the that? The Eagle Hammerhead. Uh, I ha Eagle, Eagle Hammerhead Eye yeah. Thrust. That's the one. Yes, that's we the one. We wrote us to made it. it. Yeah, yeah we did. I was on holiday that we week. We were thankfully. very proud. <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> I missed it. Oh, thank you. No, I, I, mean, well, I didn't intentionally miss it, but we, yes, our testers took it to my reproving ground. Yeah. Work yep. going on in the background. Yep. More. And I believe did a braking 10p, test. 20p, 20p, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, which somebody said, because it had a, was it, it the, the hybrid, hybrid bit, it had oh, a yeah, re generator bit, a bit somewhere. Of regen in it. Oh, it did, yes. It yes, had a, yeah. a, I yes. think that came slightly loose under braking. So <laughs> <laughs> the engine fell out. That's not. It was a prototype. You've got to learn. If well, things don't that. go wrong, yeah, you're not learning that. anything. Yeah. We were we 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 weren't sure how to take it because we, you know obviously it came to autocar because autocar is perceived as being very straight up and down and you know run by. Well, it is quite grown up. Well, yeah. compared with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose. Yeah, but, but then so's Viz compared with us. Yeah, I don't but, know. but you I still think... knew. You still knew and know the subject. And the, yeah, the reader sees it if you don't. You know, the viewer sees yeah, it. Yeah, but you, you, you will. You'll always see through, through it. it. You, yeah. you, if, you, if you're watching football punditry, it's got to be in their blood, or you wouldn't. Yeah. You wouldn't watch it. Yeah. That's right. um, yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's the problem with some football punditry these days, isn't it? You can, you can, you find yourself picking the ones that have got authority and ignoring the ones that don't. Yeah, but that's that's such is the way of it, and and yeah. it's very compelling watching people explore, talk about, share their passion for a particular subject, whatever that subject is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, you know, as long as it's legal, obviously. Interesting. Did you hear all that work then? <laughs> that's yeah, like... Yeah. That's and that's not work. tidying up work, yeah. is it? No, that, that is somebody's actual, working on a car. Yeah, that is an actual tool doing some work. 
Yeah, Don't disturb them, for God's sake. We better hide up here. If they yeah, see you, they'll, they'll get do, do they? When you're trying to film yeah. the Discovery yeah. program and they're trying to work at the same time, that presumably adds to the amount of time it takes to do things. It can it? do a bit because, you know, we've got to stop. But, I mean, the TV show just goes on around us and they go on. It is you know, it's the reality of what we're doing, so they're not. It's not. We don't have to stop. It's not like it's written. But you, I think you pointed out there's, there is a production. There's office a little here. office up here where the chimp people live. Yes, so they can they can hide out of the way. Yeah, but yeah. but they can review what's been shot and so on. No, they just eat lunch, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just sit about and play pens and pencils. I, and, I keep looking at these sort of nice, calm people that work with you and yeah. thinking how lucky you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how lucky they are. Uh, well, well, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's 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 quite fun because it's a completely different type of TV. Yeah, you know, the, the Grand Tour, Top Gear, massive, and we had we were seventy, eighty, a hundred people traveling across a Amazing. desert or wherever. Yeah, yeah. I, we're we're quite a lot smaller on this TV show. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't got I mean, that, which is great. But that's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It was amazing. It's amazing to be part of something like that. Yeah if you're into broadcasting to, on that scale but that just because something's on the other end of the scale in terms of budget doesn't mean it's any less credible or important editorially in yeah. terms of content there's more work oh my god somebody's hammering something grinding something yeah, this is the, I'm going to be rich that is. I, honestly I just, <laughs> can I just break off and how do you spell Sunseeker on order in the above <laughs> it's time well we we we're probably Coming to the end of our time with you, but but I, I just wonder what your just give us your view of the future. I mean, when you when you sort of look five years down the road, do you see yourself behind this lovely desk with the R Hammond um, <laughs> label on the front, and or or you know, is, is this it for you? Is it is is this what this is what I do? Yeah. Oh, uh, five years in the future, I'd love the smallest cog to be bigger. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd love us to have done. I'd like those shelves to be covered in awards from some amazing cars that we've done. Very nice IKEA shelves, if I may yeah, say so. Decent, aren't they? Yeah. I built them myself, you know. Yeah. I did. Um, I'd like those IKEA shelves to be bearing awards for amazing cars that we've done to inspire customers to come to us. I'd like the big car shows to be ringing us to say, hey, can we have your whatever? Say we've resto modded a SK120 or something. Yeah. Can we have that? I'd like, I'd like to continue to be part of the most exciting industry I can comprehend of. I'd like to continue to have a role in it. Um, continue tripping over you at Hampton Court or wherever we are doing what we do. <laughs> it's unlikely. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to still be part of the, the business. God, yeah. But doing this. Yeah. Like, I'm actually part of it. Well, I'm sure you've got every chance. I don't know. I seem to be bloody good at ruining it myself. <laughs> this, but I'm going to keep trying. It is hard, but I'll make it work. Pop Blinger. Richard, thank you very much for your time today. Absolute pleasure. Gentlemen, keep up the good work with the podcast. It's really important that we talk about all aspects of this subject right now because mm. there's a danger of it being misunderstood or it being steered by those who don't appreciate it. And it is amazing how voices of power are backed up sometimes by absolutely no knowledge or understanding of that, that they're <laughs> yeah. going to define. It's terrifying. So yeah. And the, the word needs to be spread. Don't be selling us all one answer. We're intelligent enough as consumers, as members of the public, as citizens, to comprehend of a world in which, in terms of transport, not everybody owns or wants to own a car. Some people want to use EVs. Some people can't afford them. Some people can't get the electricity or the resources for them. Other people choose to use internal combustion engine cars powered by synthetic fuel. Give us choice. Then you get the power of numbers on your side, and then things balance out. As soon as we're all told to do one thing, resources become scarce, and you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't a bit of campaigning then. Yeah. I should have banged the table. But banged the table. table. Oh, Mike, it's, it's only supported yeah. on trellises. I'm not sure that's <laughs> no, it's a idea. beautiful table. It might it's collapse. A very, very nice table. Yeah, real gas taps. No, yeah, I love not, them. Not, not I love them. I just, I just now, do need a Bunsen burner. Not connected. This is really cool. <laughs> Garby. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Uh, you can find Richard's, Richard Hammond's workshop on Discovery+. Plus. You can. Uh, Steve and I will be back this time next week. Thanks for listening.